open access for anyone hmm. to use software to be able to raise funds in a transparent manner. Obviously, there's retail like we've talked about, but you also mentioned angel investors, VCs. They will be able to get a reward on 30% on top of the value of their Polymate token, but in the native token of the project. Any idea who the first project? We have good ideas and we have quite a few projects lined up. What do you mean um, when you say quite a few, like three? Or no, like... it's definitely more than three. Space Monkeys blasting off with Casper Jorgensen. He's the co-founder of Polymic Protocol. And this interview was actually a long time coming. Finally, we have him on the show. Casper, welcome to Space Monkeys. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to meet. Yes, yeah. very nice. A lot has happened since we first spoke about doing this podcast. March 2023 20, in Paris, I think we met. Yeah. Here you are today, a fully launched protocol. Maybe you could start with telling us a little bit about what the world looks like without Polymic. Yeah, I think what, we, what we're saying for, for Polymic is sort of like, we want to enable community-based regulatory compliant uh, fundraising. Mm -hmm. I think if you've sort of been around in crypto for, for a lot of years, then uh, you go back to like 2017, 2018, and there was a lot of like ICO hypes and doing fundraising on, uh, on chain. Yeah. And I think history shows that a lot of these projects ended up in various kinds of trouble. Yeah. Um, for, and their investors. And their investors as well. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a lot of engagement just due to the, due to the fact of like, hey, it's a new way of, uh, of, uh, of fundraising. Yeah. But also a lot of the troubles come from, uh, from not necessarily looking at what are the primitives that regulators and, uh, and the financial uh, markets usually are, are looking at. Yeah. So that was one of the things we were looking at uh, for for Polymac and trying to see what are the technologies actually that we have developed on chain for the last many years mm -hmm. and how can we actually apply that to make sure that you can actually do fundraising both in a compliant way in uh, in a way that actually regulators can get the reporting that they that they actually need yeah. but also for actually the participants of making sure that it's fair it's transparent for all the participants and take away a lot of these centralized intermediaries or trust based uh, counterparties so as far as primitives go back in the ICO boom i guess we had one primitive and that was the token <laughs> right and yeah. did we have any others besides that <laughs> I guess, I guess a lot of focus was on the, was on the token, right? Pretty much, uh, yeah. Definitely. So, and token there wasn't that, and a good story. <laughs> yeah, and, and probably also in a way of like, there wasn't that many functionalities actually on, on the token. That's right. And I think right. that's one of the things that actually changed a lot in, in blockchain tech over the last uh, uh, five, six years. As far as primitives for compliance goes, what are some of the primitives you have built out uh, with Polymec? I think one of the key cornerstones for looking at regulators is regulators, they want to make sure that there is transparency. I think actually that's very aligned with what the, what the Web3 narrative around why blockchain is actually a good technology is that we can enable transparency and that we can enable anyone can actually see what happens on chain. However, regulators are also a bit slow, right? So mm. for very good reasons, uh, and they have certain requirements that uh, that we need to figure out from a from a blockchain perspective and from a uh, from a crypto space of how do we actually follow that mm. and. There, one of the things we're looking at, especially on the is on the KYC side. Uh, so know your customer or know your client or KYB, know your business. Yeah, uh, is very much something that if you're looking at the at the financial markets outside of crypto, this has been sort of like you have to have this, uh, and this is a key requirement for doing any kind of uh, of of work and financial intermediary work in uh, in in today's world. Mm -hmm. And I think in crypto and blockchain, we've sort of like stayed away from it because like, hey, it should happen synonymously and I can just use my wallet and then I can participate in everything I want. Sure. And with the latest sort of uh, technologies that we actually have on Polkadot, mm -hmm. then we come to the possibility of actually being able to enable to do KYC, but still do it in a way where the user stays in control of the data. Because today what happens if you go to your bank and you want to open a, open a bank account, then mm -hmm. you have to deliver passport details, uh, employment contracts, all kinds of things to your bank so they yeah. can do KYC on, on, on you as a person. Yeah. And the bank retains all that information mm. and you are happy to give it to your bank because you have a certain trust in your bank that they're yeah. going to use this for good. I think if we look at it from a, uh, and 
a crypto perspective is like, I don't necessarily want to give my passport details and all these kinds of very uh, personal information to a lot of different crypto projects because how are they going to deal with the data and wh yeah. where is my data going to end up? Mm -hmm. We talk about a whole soul about data proliferation uh, across various different uh, protocols you interact with. No one really likes that. Yeah. The whole narrative around Web3 is very much of the user stays in control of his or her data. Mm -hmm. And with the technology in Polkadot, we can actually make sure that via DADs and verifiable credentials that you can actually do KYC, but you do KYC for your own purpose, not right. for the purpose of, uh, you can use it for showing that you have KYC on Polymac, mm -hmm. but as such, the KYC belongs to you. Right. We did uh, collaboration with, uh, with Deloitte mm -hmm. uh, together with the uh, Kill Protocol. So mm -hmm. basically the KYC credentials that are used for accessing fundraisers on, on Polymac mm -hmm. is anchored on the Kill Protocol for, uh, for utilizing their technology and DIDs and verifiable credentials. Yeah. And then you have Deloitte is issuing them. But what's really important to understand is that you as a user, you decide to share your information with Deloitte. Mm -hmm. Then Deloitte will do a verification of your KYC information and issue you this verifiable credential that as such, you keep directly in your wallet. Yeah. So when you utilize it on Polymac or technically you can use it on other areas on chain, mm -hmm. you don't have to share all the information because I can trust in Deloitte that have done a KYC verification of you as a person, and you can show that to me directly on chain. And if there's, let's say there's a token that's fundraising and you know Canadians are excluded, for instance, Deloitte will tell you, Jay Trana, he actually can't do this. He's from Canada, so he's not eligible. Is that right? Yeah, it's not even Deloitte telling us. It's actually you as a person will, will tell us because you will only tell Deloitte uh, your, personal your personal information once. Yeah, that yeah. That is kept purely with Deloitte. Mm. Then when they issue a credential to you, you basically have a wallet that states your name, your address, your age, uh, year of birth, uh, nationality, and so on. Uh -huh. And then when you actually show that credential on chain, let's say for Polymac, you could have a project saying that, I would like to exclude Canadians to participate sure. because uh, there's like Canada has uh, different rules for for crypto than other other countries. So I'm sure you've been uh, been exposed to that maybe. Yes. Um, that you will then only show the really imp information that actually is necessary to take a decision for the protocol. Right. So the project doing fundraise will say, I will let's say accept Canadian citizens. Mm -hmm. Then when you want to participate, you connect your verifiable credential on Polymac, you disclose to the protocol that you have a Canadian citizenship, and then the protocol checks that this actually fits with the specification that are allowed to actually access that fundraising ground. Right, and when I show my where I live, I actually don't have to show my name, for instance, right? Exactly. This you, remains hidden from the project that's fundraising. Yeah, it's not because necessary. You don't, you don't need to know it. Right. We also don't know it from, uh, from Polymac. It happens purely on, uh, on, on chain to make sure that we actually keep people's identities uh, uh, private. Yeah. Of course, it's, it's a verifiable credential, so you can choose mm. to make it more public, or you can say a project says, hey, we need to understand people's email addresses and so on, and then you share that. Sure. But it's fully up to the person actually participating how much they want to show. And even if we want to, we can't see that data. So I think it's, it's very much of, you are participating in a synonymous way, mm -hmm. uh, but we are following sort of the, the primitive that regulators actually want to see so that they can say there is done KYC, but it's done in a way that it's much more privacy preserving and you can do it because you have a trust relationship with Deloitte. Mm. You don't need to have a trust relationship with every single project that you are engaging with. So uh, during the ICO boom and then on the launch pad since, basically there's this very kind of liquid situation where anybody can just launch a token and you can just rock up and market it and yeah. you'll get buyers or not. What does it look like in the Polymic marketplace? What's the process a project needs to go through to qualify for being exposed to these KYC, these compliant potential customers? It's one of the things that we're looking at of how do we, how do we put the community first? Okay, uh, because community as in the potential funders? 
or it will be I, that's actually that's actually a very good uh, good point because i think for us community is everyone that acts around the project yeah so a community is not only everybody talks about retail as being community right uh, so yes that's definitely a part of the community but you also then you have angel investors you have professional investors sure. you have you have vcs uh, that also are around sort of of how to actually participate in projects and you have the entire project the uh, the the whole community around the project to also be like compu- community ambassadors and so on so one of the problems that we see with a lot of the let's say launch pads and so on that uh, that we see today mm. is that it's still a highly centralized process where usually you have a team that sits and decides of like yes project a is good but project b is less good yeah or what usually happens is probably that yeah project a pays us a bit more money so we're going right. to sell project a than project b yeah um and that doesn't have to be the way but the thing is you don't know because it's intransparent right i mean i we've heard about some exorbitant fees t- for instance to list on binance's launchpad like insane mm-hmm. millions and millions yeah. right but the people who end up participating in this launchpad they had no idea that project x paid millions of dollars to have this exposure exactly and that's the, that's that's for us is we need to have a way of how do you actually make sure that you just have an open access for anyone hmm. to use software to be able to raise funds in a transparent manner. Yeah. And it could be all well and good that let's say someone paid, I don't know, a couple of millions to uh, to a launchpad or to uh, to Binance or something to help you sell uh, sell sure. tokens. Yeah, yeah. But it's also relevant information for whoever actually buy those tokens to understand who are the other participants and what are actually sort of what are the economics going on behind this. Nice. Um, so we're looking at how can we actually make that process much more transparent mm-hmm. and make the community uh, a part of that. Hmm. So what we what we actually have on Polymeg is that it's as such a platform. So as uh, the team building Polymeg, we cannot decide which project can actually launch uh, a fundraiser or not. We've actually set it up so that we have what we call an evaluation period. Hmm. So any project that wants to launch a fundraise will have to go through a public evaluation period hmm. with anyone that's eligible to uh, to participate hmm. so they can go through these are all the details of the projects the white paper light paper tokenomics team whatever the project actually wants to share and then we have a 28 day period where anyone with a polymake token can go in and uh, Staking is the wrong word, but they are locking their their Polymic tokens in support of the project. Uh, And then once the project gets enough support, it will move on to a fundraising round. So what's the incentive for locking though? So that actually comes in uh, in how we are looking at the economics of the fundraise. Okay. Of what you do with locking your tokens is that you actually have an incentive for getting rewarded by the project. Hmm. So how it works is that... The project doing the fundraise will, to the Polymic protocol, pay a fee between six and ten percent in their native tokens of the funds they raise. Okay. But these, this fee will go back to all the actors on the protocol. Oh. And a part of that fee will actually go back and be delivered directly to the uh, to the ones that are locking up their Polymic tokens. Okay. So, is there any defense against um, completely malicious projects uh, popping up here. So you have this evaluation period, but mm-hmm. it kind of sounds like potential funders would even so be incentivized to support projects that could end up doing a rug pull later on as long as they got tokens early on, right? Yeah, I think the whole the whole thing lies in the value alignment between the funders and the project and everyone around the uh, the project. Okay. So when the evaluators are locking up their, their Polymake tokens, mm. they will be able to get a reward on... 30% on top of the value of their Polymake tokens, but in the native token of the project that they yeah. support. Mm-hmm. If the project is not successful and actually doesn't do a, a proper fundraising round, we will actually slash them 20% of the Polymake tokens that they actually uh, that they actually put in support. Ah, so you okay. have, So it's a bit like you have to put your money where your mouth is. So right. if you really think the project is good, you can get rewarded, but you get rewarded in the project tokens. Yes. So you're not getting like any kind of other token because like hey you are you are very interested in this project so you should also be interested in getting rewarded in the project token cool. uh, and not anything else mm-hmm. but there also needs to be uh, an incentive to make sure that you actually do it 
thoughtfully and that if you support a project, there's also a risk that if you are just saying, is if, because if you just have 10,000 people and say, yes, this is the best project ever because sure. I might get a token, uh -huh. then everybody is just going to be happy, right? Yeah, right, but right. There, there should be the downside of like, if you support something, that's the rest of the community saying, hey, this is obviously a scammy project, then you should get uh, get a punishment as such, and that that's why we have the uh, the slashing mechanism for the for the evaluators to make sure that they actually always are uh, truthful or at least sort of interested in supporting the projects that they believe actually becomes uh, uh, become successful over time. Does the project create a stake as well that could be slashed? So the project themselves doesn't create a stake. Usually for projects doing fundraisers, it's sort of they're usually token rich and cash poor. Okay. So we don't want hmm. a Polymer token to be a gatekeeping Understood, yeah. possibility for how to actually get in and do a fundraise. It should mm -hmm. be that if you have it, then you can go out, you could do a fundraise. As a project wanting to do a fundraise, the only thing you need is that you need to be able to have a KYC for your project. Right. So you need to have a verification also done in this case by uh, Deloitte, basically the same verifiable credentials as the users will have mm -hmm. to, uh, to participate in projects will also have to be used by the project to raise funds to actually be able to show that there are actually people and a business behind this, uh, this project. So you can say the project can still be synonymous or have uh, um, and don't necessarily want to show exactly their uh, their their legal name, okay. but the user can actually trust on the fact that they have shown that they have done a verification of uh, of their identity on the on the Deloitte side. But they okay. also don't necessarily need to show it. Yeah, yeah. Although I think when you're raising funds, I think one of the things you're raising on is also the fact that hey, this is a kick-ass team that can actually deliver what you're promising. So right. I think it's always quite good to be out there and show who you are because I think that's certain things uh, that uh, that uh, that your participants actually would like to see. Super. I, I feel like this uh, polemic is a great service to projects wanting to launch. I'm sure projects, if they get some legal advice when they're just starting out, you need to be KYC. You need to have all these, you know, all the buttons done up. But here you are providing a a service that anybody can rock up to and and launch a token. Yeah. But kind of comparing to the ICO boom, this is all ERC-20 tokens, but you guys are launching on Polkadot? We're launching on Polkadot, yeah. So are you limited to pool of people who want to launch a substrate-based token or? As such, not. I think oh. we are we're building on, on, on Polkadot because Polkadot has the possibility of actually delivering this product mm -hmm. and we're utilizing the interoperability to be able to uh, to to use the kill technology for 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 DADs sure. and uh, and also move the like USDT USDC is is some of the tokens that we are that projects will actually use to fundraise in sure with that interoperability uh, on on Polkadot I think we have the primitive to be able to actually build it mm. uh, if we look at um, Ethereum or uh, any kind of uh, layer twos or rollups on Ethereum as well, you're still more bound to what the technical capabilities are of that ecosystem. Yeah. But one of the things that we really love about Polkadot is that Polkadot is also looking at a flame. Polkadot is one thing. This is where you can build because you have the technology. Mm -hmm. But then you can interoperate with the rest of the uh, of the crypto ecosystem. So. Okay. We don't want to be the ones saying, hey, yeah, no, you need to be on Polkadot. Like, no, if you have a good idea, you should build on the tech that actually supports your idea. Yeah, yeah. And then we can help you fundraise. So what actually happens on Polymake is that, as, as it is right now in an MVP, we'll go out and then you can fundraise directly on, uh, on Polkadot. And we will issue a token, what we call a contribution token. So once you... Once you participate it, you actually get a contribution token on your Polymec uh, wallet. So mm -hmm. you can see that you participated in the uh, in the project. Okay. That contribution token actually lives on Polymec as a proof of your participation. Sure. And once then the project choose to go live, then they will morph that contribution token into their mainnet token. Okay. Even so if that, it's on a different network? That could be on a different network. Okay. Uh, because the... Proof of participation token just lives on on Polymic. Okay. Also helps you with the fact that if I go out and fundraise, I don't necessarily want a token that everybody trades immediately. Yeah. That goes the whole. You had a lot of discussions also with Josh and Andy about the securities and how morphing and all these kinds of things. And 
it's really important. One of the really important things is to make sure that there's actually utility in your token. Yeah. And if you want to go out and fundraise very early on, you can't just launch a token, then the token will be traded because it's most likely a security. Okay, so this was going to be my other question because I was wondering if Polymec would actually hold on to the tokens and distribute to the contributors, but that's not the case. The case is that the tokens could be generated at a later date and then it's up to the project to fulfill their promise of yeah, so making the contributors whole. So the, uh, so the participants will actually get the tokens immediately after the, uh, after the fundraise. So as soon oh, as okay. the project says, hey, I am okay with the fundraise, I received the money, yeah. then the Polymac protocol will immediately print the equivalent uh, tokens on their, uh, on a contribution token on Polymac. Okay. But those contribution tokens are locked on Polymac, mm -hmm. so they are not tradable, but they are, I think anyone that participated in the, uh, in the first sales of DOT mm -hmm. actually got this placeholder token that was an ESC20 token that was more that was changed out for a Polkadot token once Polkadot went live. I see. Okay. This is sort of the bit of the same uh, of the same idea that you get a token that represents your participation mm -hmm. and then once the team is ready to issue their mainnet token, then we automatically morph that token into the mainnet token. So we also make it easier for all the projects doing that because you don't have to do all these like tedious claiming processes and if you participated in early stage sales and so on, then you get a soft or you get some kind of paper and then you hope that you get a token at some point and maybe yes. you need to set up a new wallet, all these kinds of white sort of manual processes where we are saying we can do that a lot better because it's blockchain. It should be able to be completely traceable. Yeah. And we can basically just morph those contribution tokens into the mainnet token and put them out on the, uh, on the network that the, uh, that the project actually needs them to be on. Good stuff. So any idea who the first project launching with Polymec is going to be? We have good ideas and we have quite a few projects lined up. What do you mean um, when you say quite a few, like three or like 13? Oh, it's definitely more than, it's definitely more than three. Okay. Um, and there's a lot, because there's a lot of uh, teams building in the Polkadot ecosystem. And yeah. it's, it's one of the things I'm passionate about. I also go out and actually have the chat with founders of like, hey, what are, what are you building? How can you fundraise? Hmm. Uh, and it's one of these things that we want to end up in actually having a quite diverse set of protocols and projects that actually are doing fundraisers on, on Polymake. So all the way from doing uh, doing sort of a sale to the community, maybe before you sort of launch your main product, but it could also be very much like pre-seed investments that uh, so you can get in very early on sure. as a community member, either being professional or a retail uh, investor, mm -hmm. but getting in on the right, uh, on the right terms. So... As such, we are not gatekeepers, so we can't even, I can't even tell you of like, hey, this is going to be the first project because as such, once ah, the protocol is right, there, right. anyone can actually launch a, launch a, launch a fundraise. Right. Of course, you need the community to help. So, uh, mm. so but, uh, but we, have, uh, we have good talks with some of the very good uh, projects in the, uh, in, in the ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, hopefully that will come out very, very soon. But, uh, okay, so after so, this, I'm going to go through my Twitter and look at all the projects that haven't launched a token yet, and we'll see. Yeah, yeah, that's going on. There is a lot. There is a lot of good projects there that <laughs> yeah. are sort of getting there, right? So, uh, how about on the um, the contributor side? Um, obviously, there's retail, like we've talked about, but you also mentioned this opportunity to have angel investors, VCs, yeah. playing now, and in, in this regulatory compliant arena, yeah, it really opens up a lot of new possibilities. Well, what, what's been your experience over there? I think it's it, it's one of these things that. Uh, at least VCs is sort of being seen as sort of like anti-crypto in some way or form, but on the other mm. hand, they are a really important part of the ecosystem, right? It's because important, yeah. uh, crypto and blockchain is expensive and you need quite a lot of money to actually develop these uh, these systems. Yes. And it usually takes quite a long time to develop them because you need to have something that's safe and secure once you actually launch it. So the 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 go to market for a blockchain based project is usually a lot longer than what you see on the, on the, like a web 2 based uh, project sure so i think venture capital and like angel investment professional investment is key to the uh, to to an ecosystem thriving and uh, and making sure that we actually get enough uh, uh, funding in for the uh, for the projects mm -hmm. and there was we were looking a bit of like how do you how do we make this a bit more transparent because inherently, when you look at like uh, venture capital, it's capital. They have investors that uh, that are investing in this because they think this is going to be the future. Mm. Um, and 
they have huge muscles and huge uh, like uh, funds that can, that can invest, but they only have they have a certain part of the value for Web3 project. I think if you look at like a blockchain based project, it's like yes, you can have three or four VCs putting in a lot of money, yeah, but they are probably not going to be the ones that are going to be your users in the end. I think in, yeah. in the end, it's like your the, your token holders are usually your users yes. there. So you need to have a lot of community engagement as well. And Interesting. what we what we have seen in in the in, in the blockchain space is usually the very early opportunities comes for like if you look usually at investment, it's like hey, people start with a friends and family round, and then they try to go to maybe angels, maybe VCs, mm -hmm. and at some point, sort of along the road, then you get like retail or the community in. Sure. But on the other hand, it's like, why don't you sort of get community in a lot earlier? I right. think that was actually what, if you saw it, uh, like, yeah, in the ICO, ICO boom and so on, that you actually had a lot of community engagement there yeah, because yeah. you could actually get into interesting projects very early on and be right. an early stage, uh, early stage participant here. Mm. And I think that is really good, but you also need to make sure that they take decisions on the same level of detail as the VCs and the professional investors. I see. So that's what we are what we're doing with uh, with Polymac of making sure that the that the community investors and the uh, is value aligned. So both VCs, professional investors, but also retail investors are investing on a level playing field where everybody has the same information. Mm -hmm. It's transparent on chain. We have actually split it up in two different uh, processes. So what happens on Polymac after a project is approved for fundraise? Via the uh, via the uh, evaluation mechanism, yeah. Then there actually are two fundraising rounds, or two steps to a fundraising round. Okay. So first of all, we we have what we call an auction round. Hmm. The auction round is VCs, professional investors, uh, and angels can participate here, and that is a round where they can they can bid up the price. Okay. So a project will set a minimum uh, valuation on the amount of tokens that they would like to uh, they would like to offer and then VCs and uh, and professionals can go in and say hey I would like an allocation if there's more interest than the allocation then of course the price will go up okay supply and demand yeah yeah but then after that round auction round then we open up for the rest of the community, so also the retail or the or like let's say smaller like investors that might get smaller uh, allocations, mm -hmm. but they will always they will get in at the weighted average price of the large investors. So we make sure that it's not just a game of like, hey, if I'm a VC, I get a huge discount and it come in. Right. You can actually come in as a small investor and say, hey, I also want to participate, and I do it under. Fair terms compared to what the uh, what what the VCs and the professional came in at. So each round has its own allocation, and the the price of the second allocation is determined it's by the action first. Always determined by the first one. Fantastic. So it's all it's always of like if the if the if the VCs and professional thinks it's worth more, then obviously the price will go up, and sure. then the community will also pay more for it. Right. But the community will not end up in getting bought out because. I think there's this phrase of that uh, that the the retail investor is sort of the exit liquidity of the VCs, uh -huh. and sort of like we want to get away with that because I think that's one of the reasons why if you look at regulators they're like, hey, if you're cheating your community, you're part of your community, mm -hmm. then yeah. that doesn't work, right? Yeah, treat everybody fair uh -huh. and make sure that you do uh, fundraise that. If you go down and you have to tell to your local regulator what you actually did, that mm -hmm. you can do it with open eyes and saying we did it. A fair and transparent way, and that's sure. really what we uh, what we're looking at for Polymac. How do you actually do right uh, vesting schedules? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you don't want any, anyone to actually dump on the on on, on the first day. That's not Obviously. that's not value aligned for for the project and mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. anyone that actually are participating. So what you do is that when you actually participate in the fundraising round on Polymac, then depending on you need two different uh, tokens for that. Hmm. And you need your KYC credential. So to be able to participate in fundraising round, you need to show your KYC credential. It needs to match the requirements of the project raising funds. Mm -hmm. Then you need Polymic tokens to determine how much of an allocation can you actually get access to. Oh. So let's say you have a thousand dollars worth of uh, Polymic tokens. Then 
the equivalent allocation would be $1,000 worth of what the project actually offers. Ah. However, depending on your investor uh, classification, so VC, professional or, or retail, yeah. you can add on to that $1,000 worth of Polymac tokens up to 20 t 25 times that uh, number of, uh, of tokens in the allocation. Oh. That will then be giving your um, your vesting period subsequently. So let's say if you're a VC, then you can actually say, if I have $1,000 worth of Polymac tokens, I can invest 25 times that in, let's say, USDT or USDC on Polymac. Then you'll actually get a vesting period of linear release over a year. But if I say I have $1,000 worth of Polymac tokens and invest $1,000 in that project, I actually only get a lockup of... I think it's uh, it's yeah exactly. If you only do it for for the seven days, you get it immediately. I see. Uh, yeah. Say you do it two times, then but you get smaller, seven days. Smaller so, allocation. Yeah. If your Polymac holdings is very much equivalent to what you invest in every project, yeah. then you actually get your liquidity quite fast. Mm -hmm. If you want to leverage the fact that I don't have as much Polymac tokens, but I want a large allocation, yeah. Then you actually have to be locked up for for a longer period of time on the on the actual tokens of the projects. And am I locking my thousand dollars worth of Polymac tokens on this project in particular, or am I locking it up into Polymac and then I can use that allocation size across multiple projects? So you can use it again when the tokens then unlocks, because it's it's one of the ways that we actually looked at the um, at the regulation and say what 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 is it that the regulators are looking for in 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 regulating these uh, fundraising mechanisms or or making sure that it's fair for anyone participating. Yeah, and. And one of those things is that there needs to be some kind of risk uh, awareness from the buyers. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have uh, someone just putting in all their money in one in one project because this is, if it's early stage startups, the risk is quite high. Mm. So you want to make sure that if you don't have that much of uh, of uh, funds to actually invest. You want to spread out your investment because there are different uh, projects that you can make a return on. So if you spread it out, the risk the, the risk of you losing everything is less than if you put everything into one project because as such, every not every project is going to be a success. Okay. And if you look at VCs or professionals, they're allowed to take bigger risks on one project where if you then look at uh, at more retail based investors they should actually spread out their uh, their investment more to make sure that they take a diversified risk over um, a more spread out uh, portfolio but if you are going on and doing quite a lot more investment then of course you get knowledge so the more funding rounds I actually participate in, the ah. more knowledgeable I get about it. So we mm. allow you to actually, the more you actually use the protocol, oh. then you actually get more knowledge. Hence, you can actually invest with uh, with uh, with bigger amounts for the same amount of polymer tokens over time. That's very cool. So okay. it's sort of a risk management mechanism. Oh, good. That's very cool. So let me just use a hypothetical here to make sure I have this down pat. So let's say there's two projects fundraising on Polymac, okay? Yeah. And I want to get a... $25,000 allocation in project A and a $1,000 allocation in project B. I need to go into the market, buy $1,000 worth of Polymac tokens, lock them for a long period for project A, and I can get a 25 allocation. Then I go back to the market, buy another $1,000 of Polymac, lock it in here for a short time, and I can get a 1,000 allocation on B. Yeah. Is that correct? That will be correct. Okay, and mean, meanwhile, I'm exposed, to, I'm exposed to Polymac price action when I'm locked for a long time on project A, right? That's true. Mm. But that's also why we have additional incentives for actually for participating in the in the different fundraisers. Sure. So to be able to do a 25 times your your thousand your your thousand dollars worth of uh, of Polymac tokens, yeah. you need to be a, a VC. Uh, but if you're actually a long-term holder, so let's say you hey, this is a great project, I want to be in the long term. Yeah. Then we talked before about that there are incentives for the evaluators to get tokens for evaluating projects uh, before the fundraise. Mm. We also have rewards for the people that are long-term involved in projects. So if you hold your tokens for more than 18 months, mm. you actually have a participation right in a pot of tokens that comes from the fundraise as well. So if you are long-term aligned with the ecosystem for that project, then you actually get a reward for, uh, for that part as well. It's a very interesting economy that you're building here. Kind of what's unique about this project is you're gonna have a lot of new tokens all in one place. Yeah. Have you given any thought to what you might 
like what you could build on top of this protocol and put kind of all this liquidity to use? Yes, we have in, in, in some way or form, because of course there will be a lot of, there's a lot of new tokens here. And I'm sure that it's an open protocol, everything is open source. If someone wants to build something on, on top of it, that's uh, that's definitely uh, that definitely a possibility. Mm. This is the nice thing about blockchain, that people get a good idea and hey, we can use some of the things that we have here for uh, for making new primitives and new uh, new products. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as such, all the contribution tokens will be locked on the network, and for most uh, for projects, it doesn't really make sense to have those ones traded a lot because you just end up in when you want to build something, then all of a sudden you have a lot of trading tokens and you have price pressure that you need to manage and so on. So I think yeah. for most projects, it's actually nicer to be in control of the when I actually want to launch my token mm. because all these con- all these contribution tokens, I think, depending on your Whatever country you uh, you are you are based in would have different ways of uh, regulators. If you start trading those ones, regulators probably have different ideas about what those tokens are because mm-hmm. there might not be a full functionality function network underneath it. Yeah. But then you the project can decide of like, hey, I only do my mainnet token once there's full functionality on the network, mm. and then the token that you keep on Polymake is purely just a representation of the participation right that you have. Yeah. Understood. Okay, so no, no DeFi madness uh, being built. DeFi madness might be a bit uh, might be a bit of a strong word, but <laughs> we are we are definitely we are definitely <laughs> looking at what are the possibilities of actually using what we're building on Polymake yeah. for what we also call regulatory compliant DeFi. Okay, of that fundraising obviously is one thing. Yeah, yeah. But you all of a sudden when you have users that already have a KYC, right, and they have tokens underneath KYC that they can that they can transfer and it can be provenly that there's KYC. Sure. Then I think you can all of a sudden you can start actually looking at how do you do a regulatory compliant environment where people can use crypto to actually invest in other areas where KYC still is required. Right. Of course, there's there's DeFi on chain as it is today, which is very much no KYC and everybody's uh, Doing a lot of interesting things with the with tokens. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's a, there's a lot of the financial market today that's very reliant on uh, on KYC on uh, on some kind of uh, traceability of the contributor or the investor in those projects. Uh, and there, I think we could definitely play a role of saying you can participate. You can participate anonymously, mm-hmm. but whatever product. And important of like not necessarily projects, but it could be products, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because there's a lot of financial products today. That's hey, how can I invest in this if I'm a crypto user, mm-hmm. or I don't want to go down into my bank and invest in some kind of advanced financial product? Because why should I go to my bank and they need to do onboarding KYC or these kinds of things? If I already have KYC wallet issued by Deloitte, yeah. and I have a thousand dollars worth of of, uh, of USDT, maybe I don't want to put it into an early stage project to uh, to hope that this project is going to be good and then in a year or two years or something I get the, I get the tokens out mm-hmm. but maybe I want to invest in, in other kinds of financial market products but I don't want to go for my bank but then we can look at, uh, at Polymec as being uh, as being a way of actually interacting with uh, the financial market in a regulatory compliant way so that's sort of when we're looking at regulatory compliant DeFi or putting that the regulatory compliance on top and looking at what are the products actually there where mm-hmm. we can really deliver something that we don't see anywhere else in, in crypto today. That's it. I was just thinking how the KYC is actually solving in a way this proof of personhood problem, which is then linked with risk management as far as credit scores go. Yeah. Right. So you can have a whole new type of lending market if you have a bunch of participants who are KYC, right? Is this yeah. true? Yeah. And, and especially you could say the, the, the proof of personhood is actually one of the things that the KYC actually solves because, right. well, there's a cost to there's the cost to KYC that mm-hmm. the user will have to pay. Mm-hmm. So, just you can't just get ten thousand KYCs because right. first of all, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Yes. Second of all, a KYC is still issued by, in this case, Deloitte, so a centralized party, and they yeah. will also they will not uh, go in and say, "Hey, we issue ten thousand KYCs to this person because it's the same person." Why do you need 
10,000 of them because then you can attack it and, and so on. So you can actually do like these distributions that require proof of personhood yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on, on utilizing the KYC for that. Ah, yeah, I didn't think about that. So you can also uh, ensure a wide distribution of a token as well to avoid centralization. Exactly. Wow, that's so neat. And there you don't even have to, you don't have to inform anything about about yourself. You can just say if it's if it's only proof of personhood. Yeah. You just say, hey, you have a Deloitte issued KYC credential. You can participate. Right. And then you know that you will have quite a wide distribution because there is this uh, uh, there is this uh, KYC certificate behind it. Casper, how did you get involved in this? Because personally, when I first got in the Polkadot space, Polymec was the first or second project I wrote like a an educational thread about. Yeah. You know, I dove deep, and then I didn't hear about Polymec for a while. Yeah. And then, you know, here you are back with the product ready to go. Um, yeah, how'd you get involved? Long journey. Really? Okay. Um, I'm originally an auditor. Uh, so huh? uh, I started uh, finance and, uh, and ended up in various like, big international companies, including uh, Maersk, a big uh, shipping giant. Oh. Uh, and we were trading fuel oil for these, uh, for the, for these ships. Hmm. Uh, and obviously... Nothing to do with with crypto whatsoever, but very much sort of into the trading part and the sort of financial markets. And then I was looking at sort of what should be the next challenge. Mm. And then uh, um, I actually ended up doing an own startup for privacy, so GDPR mm. and uh, and sort of the legal uh, ah, ramifications yeah. of that. And that didn't fly for for various reasons. Uh, but then started to look at hey, what should be the next thing? And here came Web3 Foundation, hmm. uh, and they were looking for a CFO at that time in, uh, in Zug. And Zug also being a huge commodity uh, trading area, I was looking around, in and around Zug of like, what are the interesting uh, uh, positions that are there right now? Hmm. And then looking at blockchain of being something where you can say, hey, there is inherently a part of trading and so on, and commodities trading and so on in, in this, but there's also quite a lot of privacy. And... Web3 and the promise of what actually we're building with uh, with Polkadot is sort of like, hey, we can actually preserve privacy, which is one of the things I looked at with my privacy startup is that most companies have either no idea or they don't have the right tools to do it. Hmm. So, okay, we probably need to go in and we actually need to build these tools so that, uh, so that we can actually keep people's uh, personal information private. And... A part of that journey was also working with the uh, Kill Protocol and uh, and Ingo, uh, and I think Ingo did the first idea of Polymic. I think in 2019, yeah, of a way of of issuing uh, issuing tokens uh, underneath uh, underneath credentials. Mm -hmm. So had ongoing discussions with uh, with Ingo for for quite some time, and all of a sudden, I think we realized that this was ending up being quite a lot bigger than something that we just that we can just just launch the code and then expect it to uh, that that everybody is just going to uh, going to work with it the right way because yeah, yeah. there's a lot more work on making sure that how do we get the right ones in to do the KYC and yeah uh, i think originally the plan was to launch on asset hub like it was just like a little thing yeah, built on asset hub right it was sort of it was sort of it was actually sort of a bit of the same thing as what asset hub is doing but uh -huh. with the credentials and so on right, so it's right. sort of a lot of these things evolved and mm -hmm. then we were uh, and then we were like hey let's figure out how we build a fully fledged fundraising mechanism with the right incentives for all the different parties interacting oh. because that's that was sort of what wasn't in the original idea of uh, of polymic was not how you do actually the right fundraise how do you make sure that all different parties on the fundraise are value aligned uh -huh. and if you look at regulation i think that's probably the value alignment and making sure that it's transparent for anyone that participate mm -hmm. is equally important to actually have the KYC. Hmm. Um, so, uh, so, so that is sort of where, where, where it stemmed out from. And now we've been building for a bit over, over, over two years. Uh, we are now a team of 11 uh, full-time employees working on it. Right. Uh, or team members, we should call it. Um, so, yeah. And there are 
more good ideas and, and things to do than uh, than hands. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the case in, in any kind of, uh, of startup that uh, that you idea rate quite a lot and how can you actually improve your product and, uh, mm. and, and come up with new ideas based on what you're building. Okay, well, look, the first fundraising on Polymec is going to be a big event. I'm very interested to see how it goes. These tokenomics are so fascinating and uh, I'm very interested to see how that all pans <laughs> out. So congratulations on building such a unique and uh, and great protocol. We'll have to see how it goes. Thank you. And thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.